Greetings and welcome to week seven. This is a busy week as we cover a tremendous amount of information relative to regulatory and privacy concerns, as well as the general topic of electronic health records. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with the assigned readings and aligned tasks this week because there are quite a few. As I mentioned in the introduction, a large part of this week will be spent exploring the electronic health record and computers in general. Let's start with a pretty remedial overview of what makes up a computer in terms of hardware. A central processing unit, or CPU, can be thought of as the brain of a computer. It literally controls all processing functions of information passing to and from the device. Input devices allow users to enter information into the system. Think about your broad experiences with a computer. What do we interact with while using it? If you guessed we use a mouse, keyboard, camera, or any other sort of equipment used to place information into a computer system, you are 150% accurate. An output device is something that allows a user to extract information produced by the computer. An easy example of this is a printer. I'd also argue that in some cases a USB stick can serve as both an input and output device. Speaking of USB sticks and its purpose, let's cover storage devices. These components hold data that will be used during processing. Hard drives, USB sticks, CDs, etc. fall into this category. Networking equipment are those items that allow a computer to connect to a network. This connection allows us all to interact with others on the network. This would include wires, modems, routers, etc. that physically and wirelessly connect a device to the network or internet. Moving on to software, all things are developed on a specific operating system software platform. Think Windows, Apple, etc. Those operating systems consist of a collection of programs that control how the hardware interacts and processes requests. Application software are those programs that a user executes for a specific purpose. For example, my operating system is Windows 10, and the application software that I'm currently using as I speak to you is Microsoft PowerPoint. Pretty simple, right? Now that we have a general idea of what exactly makes up a computer, let's move on to health records and the evolution of electronic health records as a whole. There are many different terms that are used to describe automated records, and this slide lists a few of them. Computerized medical record was a classification given in the 70s that was used to ultimately describe juvenile automation efforts with patient records. Computer-based patient record was a term used in the 80s to describe a broader view of what a patient record should look like in an electronic format. This is where we first conceptualized what should specifically make up a record both administratively and clinically. Electronic medical record, or EMR, was a term that was coined in the 90s to describe systems that were based on various standalone systems. Computerized patient records and EMR terms were used basically interchangeably. Lastly, the electronic health record, or EHR, is a term used by Health Level 7 as we continue to develop standards around what this electronic environment looks like or should be. This is a standard by which all EHR developers meet so that they can appropriately prepare for the exchange of health information nationwide, internationally, in an interoperable manner. This specific slide does a great job of listing out exactly what electronic data capture systems for patient records specifically should support. This was the first formalized shot at getting all activities captured within the electronic health record, from admission, order entry, down through to discharge in a safe and secure manner. A longitudinal patient record contains information regarding patients, but from multiple encounters rather than a single one. The term population health management comes to mind here because we are concerned more about the overall person or population rather than a single episode in their treatment activity. Population health and the proactive management of individuals and populations will become huge and it will continue to evolve over the next 10 to 15 years with almost absolute certainty that it will impact the healthcare industry in a dramatic manner. Let's review the advantages and disadvantages of manual or paper-based and automated electronic record systems. One of the primary advantages of a manual record keeping practice is that it's relatively cheap to start up. Training is very straightforward for a multi-generational staff as technical skills are not necessarily a must. With a paper-based system, the notion of a downtime is non-existent as well. Now for the downside to this approach. 
With things being paper-based, the retrieval process, which we've covered in a past week, is not as easy as it would be in the electronic world. Handwritten information can also be hard to read or impossible altogether. Now I'm going to stop here and state that this is a huge patient safety issue that has frankly plagued the del delivery of healthcare for years. The process of abstraction, which we've covered as well, is more difficult because you have to manually go through paper charts. Gaps in documentation are very difficult to identify even with a post-discharge analysis. This not only leaves incomplete charts, but it decreases the amount of funding a facility or provider will receive for the treatment of care. Let's shift to the advantages of an automated or electronic record system. Access is dramatically improved because many can use the charts at once rather than being limited on where a singular file is located. Patient record storage is also eliminated, but honestly, I have to state that what you give up in paper storage, you make up for by managing the servers that you store your electronic data on. Patient information is also legible because it's typed out rather than handwritten most of the time. Data is also captured pretty close to real time, so it's more efficient in the long term. Continuing on with the list of advantages, a majority of electronic health record systems allow a portion of users to view customized views to match their workflows. Updates are easily rolled out, but speaking from personal experience managing software upgrades, that doesn't always mean that the process is painless. The EHR also allows for enhanced security of patient information as a result of security logic that's coded into the various software platforms. Lastly, unnecessary administrative costs are theoretically reduced when you limit your dependence on a paper-based system. Now, I'm slightly guilty of starting to mix the disadvantages with advantages, but this slide starts to list out specifics. Obviously, technology comes with an increased startup cost. The sp selection of a specific electronic record and the development allowing for a successful implementation is also very time consuming. Staff training is not only time consuming, it's also costly. Even then, it's also a pretty big burden for all of those involved. A transition to an automated record comes with a lot of change, which can be very scary for the various staff members. I've seen the disadvantages listed here turn into incredible advantages with the right planning and administrative support though. An EHR basically rips up the ground beneath you and it replaces it with an alternative that could not be any more different. Empathy and patience during the training process can go a very long way. When automated records are put into place, the organization now will depend on a technical staff. Continuing on with my comments on change, there will be a bit of resistance here, so careful considerations must be made for this effort to be successful. Literally, physically, and spiritually, I could spend about 26 weeks covering this topic alone. The benefits of an EHR, all things said, largely outweigh the disadvantages as long as careful considerations and planning are put into place. While transitioning to an electronic health record system, the implementing organization will need to do some historical backloading activities. This will involve scanning of historical documents into the new system so that historical patient data is not lost. There is a considerable amount of prep work that goes into this as we prep our documents for the scanning process, but it's absolutely important. Records for patients become mixed in a hybrid manner where we have historical documents intertwined with that of an electronic nature. Now let's talk about the transition. The transition to an electronic health record system can take between one to two years with continuous development work to improve the system thereafter. And the, the, the scanning of documents it kind of is the, the starting point for that and the reason why it takes so long. Now let's take a moment to review the American Recovery Reinvestment Act of 2009, or more commonly referred to as ARA. This is a piece of legislation that really catapulted the use of EHRs into the stratosphere. There were incentives for adoption as well as quantifiably proven outcome metrics. New federal, state, and local administrations always have impacts on policy, so it's going to be incredibly interesting to see how this type of legislation evolves over time. Let's talk about the makeup of an EHR for a moment. We take clinical data and group it into a structure based off of its intended uses and meaning. You have characters that make up specific words or data elements. A grouping of characters will form fields, and a collection of fields will form a record. These records are combined with others from the patient to form an overall file. Once this data is 
collect it and used to interpret findings or, or create meanings, it is then thought of to be information. All this is pretty abstract, but it's step one in understanding the, the components of a record in general. There are several different subtypes of software that address the entire continuum of care. There's the registration, admit, discharge, and transfer systems. This is the application responsible for managing the input or movement of patients within the electronic health record system. Revenue cycle based applications are also lumped into this category. Next you have clinical applications or the computer programs used by clinical professionals to document information relative to a patient. These cover monitoring activities, pharmacy events, labs, radiology, nursing documentation, as well as general medical documentation not captured in those specific categories. These applications must work in tandem to adequately complete the entire patient data picture. The next few slides will show a few examples from these specific categories. The picture in this slide shows a patient registration system and a sample of how insurance information is inputted. This specific screenshot shows a sample of how patient history is documented, stored, and categorized within an EHR. This example shows how patient intake information is documented. Height, weight, vitals, among other bits of information are collected here. On a few occasions during this lecture, I've already mentioned that these transitions come with many challenges during the implementation phase. Organizations undergoing efforts such as this must all be in sync about strategy as well as remain empathetic to the changes that are occurring. This would include outlining a detailed roadmap of this implementation that will likely take several years to execute. Training must be a huge consideration here as well so that adoption rates explode rather than decreased after an EHR goes live. Now that we have a general understanding of electronic health record systems, let's move into the legal and policy landscape in healthcare. A law is a formalized rule that has been passed via legislative action dictated by a, a specific regulation or a precedent that's set during a legal ruling. Laws can be broken into a few specific sources, administrative, case or common law, or statutory law. Administrative law includes regulations created by administrative agencies of the government. Regulations provide parameters about how a specific law is to be interpreted and enforced. Case law, or common law, is based on judicial decisions and precedents rather than on statutes. Think about Supreme Court rulings and their impacts as an example here. Lastly, statutory laws are those laws created via legislative action. These can be amended, repealed, or expanded by the same legislative bodies that pass them. Let's look at some of the principles of case law. This first bullet is Latin for things done. The takeaway for this is that hearsay is admissible or disqualified as evidence. The second bullet point means the thing speaks for itself, which is another way of stating that findings are obvious or self-evident. Next up is the Latin term for the thing is decided, which means in legal terms that the final judgment is conclusive, pretty self-explanatory. Next is the Latin phrase for let the master answer, which specifically means that the employer is responsible for legal consequences of a specific employee's action. Lastly, this bullet stands for to stand by things decided, which means to treat a decision as doctrine of precedent. The court will use this precedent for all future like cases. There are a few subpoena types to consider as well. The first will require a person to appear directly in court to testify on a given matter. If someone were to fail to show, they could receive punishment via fines or imprisonment in extreme circumstances. This second type is a written command via the court clerk that orders someone to appear in court with documents. We see this pretty commonly in the healthcare industry when there's lawsuits related to malpractice or things like that. From an operational perspective, the medical record can also be thought of as a business record for the institution. It lists all activities, encounters, and outcomes of a patient visit, so it's really the most comprehensive review of business operations on a patient-by-patient -patient level. This second bullet point is somewhat of a Captain Obvious statement, but the point is an important one to continue to hit home about. HIM professionals are charged by their aligned institutions to keep patient information secure and continue to push for complete patient information in whatever patient record system that's being utilized. Anything that a patient communicates to a healthcare professional is considered private. This privileged communication and the expected confidentiality are basic patient rights in healthcare. 
So this is an expectation regarding privacy, and there's a burden to ensure that all of our patient health information remains secure. The Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996 was implemented to safeguard patient information. If you haven't signed a HIPAA form, it's likely that your guardian has at some point. This is the first federal law that dictated some bit of patient privacy and the role of a healthcare institution in that equation. The Health Information Technology for Economic and Clinical Health Act of 2009, or the HITECH Act, takes this step a bit further in that there are now requirements around how to handle data breaches. So HIPAA provides a framework for how our data should remain safe, and HITECH provides requirements around how we are notified when data breaches occur that may or may not impact us. There are a ton of different other pieces of legislative activity in your course textbook that, that impacts the healthcare venue, so I would encourage each of you to continue to review that information so that you're aware of all of them. PHI is now your charge as a health information management professional, so it's important to know the hows and whys behind the appropriate releases of information. It is our responsibility to know when authorization is and is not required. It is also important to note that individuals have a legal right to request records regarding their PHI. The tracking of PHI disclosures must be kept up by the HIM department, and there are a few examples in Chapter 9 of your course text regarding what these kind of look like. Please note that federal and state requirements will ultimately dictate the historical record requirements in this space similar to all other aspects of patient health information. That concludes our Week 7 lecture. We covered the topic of electronic health record systems, as well as a compare-contrast scenario regarding the traditional paper-based methods. We ended the week having a brief discussion about the legal landscape and some of the policies and legislative efforts that impact our lives as HIM professionals. Next week, we review the coding and reimbursement process within healthcare and conclude with the lecture portion of this introductory class in a quick review so that you can begin preparing for your final examination.